So our first speaker is uh, Kim Thompson from the Aquarium of the Pacific. She's going to, her title of her talk is uh, Marine Aquaculture Outreach and Education at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And uh, recently a video was released. Uh, I think NAA was one of the groups that uh, did mass distribution, including from your, your group. And so it's a very good video. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And we do have a pointer if you want to use it. Oh, you brought Okay. So you're all set to go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I hope you've all had your caffeine. I promise to make this quick and painless. So my name is Kim Thompson. I'm the program manager of the Aquarium of the Pacific Seafood Conservation and Outreach Program, Seafood for the Future. For those of you who don't know, the Aquarium of the Pacific is located in Long Beach, California. And we've been hosting discussions and dialogue about marine aquaculture and its potential to feed a growing population while reducing our environmental impacts for more than a decade. And I'll just get to the punchline. Why the Aquarium, a conservation organization, is promoting marine aquaculture because it is an important conservation tool. I think everybody in this room understands that. So the question we have is, we know that it can be produced with fewer environmental impacts. It can be produced with fewer land and fresh water resources, fewer greenhouse gas emissions. It can provide ecosystem services, like cleaning the water column. It can provide habitats, and it can even enhance wild fish stocks. So why is it in the US that we are struggling to expand marine aquaculture? And I should also backtrack on this. I realize that not all of you are marine focused. Um, and we do promote aquaculture as a whole and aquaculture as well in the global food supply. But our primary focus is marine aquaculture. So again, getting to that question, why haven't we been able to successfully expand uh, marine aquaculture in the US? And the answer is that perception has not kept pace with the science. We know that we have the science and technologies to do it the right way, but unfortunately, public perception has not kept up with that information. So recently, there's a group called Science for Nature and People, or SNAP. Mike Rust is a, a part of this group. And what they did was they analyzed newspaper headlines from around the world. These are two of the um, takeouts from that particular paper. And they used that as a gauge for public sentiment towards aquaculture. So when they looked at headlines with marine aquaculture, you can see it's not too bad. It's pretty, pretty neutral. Right there, it's the second one. It's pretty neutral. But even that neutrality and that indifference could be a, a pill when it comes to addressing public perceptions. And then we have the, the headlines that featured offshore aquaculture. And you can see that that's pretty polarizing. The US actually looks like was number one for negative perceptions. So why is this, and who is driving these perceptions? So seafood advisory programs like ours have traditionally focused on consumer-based influence for the supply chain to make change in the supply chain. This is not an entirely terrible idea. It still has its place. But the bottom line is it doesn't work as well as we had once hoped that it would. And the reason being is because the media and NGOs have the largest impact and influence on public perceptions. Case in point, farm salmon. So from a consumer perspective, we know that consumers, first and foremost, are going to demand price, quality, and availability above all else. And salmon is a great example of this. Salmon has been public enemy number one on every NGO conservation organization's list for the past 20 years. Yet in that same time frame, salmon has remained one of the top three consumed seafood items in the US. And we know that most of that comes from farmed sources. So the media and NGO have a huge influence. And part of the issue with this is that you have this very specific, what I call the sustainable seafood bubble. So this is how a lot of the NGOs tend to define sustainability when it comes to looking at sustainable seafood and even marine aquaculture. They tend to put it in these very neat silos, these little tidy systems. And they do that for a good reason. They do that because these are quantifiable. These are metrics that they can measure and then they can create their recommendations from. The problem is that these are the leading driving forces that are informing the media and therefore informing the public. So these are the metrics by which the public perceives the sustainability. And I should also note that those greenhouse gas emissions are a very new addition to those advisory programs. But what we know is that sustainable seafood doesn't really fit in those tidy silos. It's a lot more complicated. There's a lot of issues that can't be quantified. 
So the question is, how do we get the media to start talking about seafood and specifically aquaculture in a different context to start getting the public to understand the complexities, uh, but also not shying away from wanting to learn more? So these are some of the challenges we have for, uh, for addressing public misperceptions about aquaculture. So as I mentioned, the media and the NGOs, they tend to amplify perceived risks. So we know that we have the science and technology to address a lot of the issues that they perceive as risks for bringing in marine aquaculture, but the public doesn't quite understand that. There's also a lack of cohesiveness among and between stakeholder groups on aquaculture messaging. So I guarantee you the messages that are gonna come out of this room, the discussions that we are gonna have are gonna be very different from the discussions that are currently taking place in Seattle where they have the Sea Web seafood, Sustainable Seafood Summit. And I don't know if any of you got to see the Seafood Champions Award, the five people who were awarded. Not a single aquaculture person was awarded in that. There's also limited funding and resources available for education and outreach. That is not due to lack of effort on your part. Sea Grant has been fantastic. But if we broaden that and we look at foundations and other sources of funding, it's pretty scarce to get funding for perception. If you go to a foundation and say, I want some funding to address public perception, they're gonna laugh you out of their office. <clears throat> going back to the cohesiveness with messaging, we also have the pointing fingers. I'm sure you guys have all witnessed this with the stakeholders you work with. In California, we have shellfish guys pointing fingers at the fin fish guys. We have closed containment versus net pen. We have wild versus farmed. These things have got to stop. We have to start looking at aquaculture and wild capture fisheries and the seafood bubble as a whole. We have to look at seafood's role in the global food supply and how can these methods of production complement each other moving forward. But that is not the way the current discussion is framed. And then there are the perceived associations with disasters. So we see this with the Gulf of Mexico um, fishery management plan that was pr proposed for marine aquaculture. The general public tends to associate it with a potential disaster such as the BP oil spill. So this is one of the obstacles to getting the public to accept marine aquaculture in that region. So again, context is key. If we want to start discussing aquaculture in a broader context, we want to start looking at it in terms of what sustainability actually looks like and the power of marine aquaculture as a conservation tool. We have to work together. We have to work across diverse channels to start giving these messages in proper context. And this is where the aquarium comes in. So the aquarium is not small potatoes when it comes to reaching out to the general public. Within our own facility, last year we had 1.7 million visitors come through our doors. We are also one of the most diverse aquariums in terms of our audience in the US. You can also see we have a rather large social media following, over 150K followers. I do have to admit, though, with that YouTube, that 300,000 hit, that's usually the cute furry sea otters and the dapper penguins. I challenge all of you, if you can create an aquaculture video that can beat the otters or the penguins, I think we've solved this problem. <laughs> So some of the target audience that we're able to address. So through the aquarium umbrella and through the audiences that come through our door, we can reach out to community opinion leaders. We can reach out to students and we can reach out to the general public. Seafood for the Future offers us additional opportunities to work with additional stakeholders. So we can work with members of the industry, we can work with producers, we can work with you guys, with scientists um, and politicians. So let's look at public outreach though within the aquarium. So how many of you have heard of Science on a Sphere, seen it, been to the NOAA Maryland office? So some of you are familiar. So Science on a Sphere is a really cool platform. So you can see there we have the globe. So what happens is it's a, it was developed by NOAA and it's a NOAA program. And you have this blank sphere with projectors that come in and you can project data sets that come in a, a global format, and we have data sets on ship traffic, on airline traffic, we have changes in ocean temperature. We were able to watch the tsunami that caused the Fukushima um, disaster. But one of the really cool aspects of Science on a Sphere is we can create stories. We can create short programs. So what the aquarium did in 2014 is we created a short seven minute program on marine aquaculture. And the great thing about this is that once you create a program, you put it on the Science on a Sphere platform, any institution, as you can see, there's 137 of them, and they're mostly in North America, but they're all over the world, um, they can then use these programs to share with their publics. 
So this particular program is shown at the aquarium two to three times a day. It was also translated in Japanese and Spanish, and it was shown in the Discovery Center in Japan for a short time. We also have our exhibit, which I was really excited about. And I have to tell you guys, so I heard that I was getting an aquaculture exhibit. I was super excited. I was thinking we could have like a replica of a net pen and a little mini ecosystem, maybe some yellowtail or salmon. And I was quickly deflated when I was told it was too small to house those fin fish. So we do have replicas of the mussel ropes. We do have some oyster trays. We have some abalone. And I did get my fin fish. It's a little baby white sea bass that's about this big. <laughs> So he's there. Um, but what this exhibit does is it's part of Vanishing Animals. So Vanishing Animals tells the story of extinctions from land, from the dinosaurs, all the way to how we're starting to slowly encroach on the oceans. And aquaculture is presented as a potential solution to reduce our impacts on the ocean and maybe slow the rate of extinctions. So you can see here we have the actual live animal exhibit. We have some copy and signage. And then we also have about a 30-second video that loops with um, captions, there's no sound to it, but it has those compelling images. We also have our monthly messages. So the monthly messages are used by our education department. What we do, by monthly message, it's usually actually about two to three months at a time. We choose a topic, and then we create a one-pager with some succinct facts that then our education team can share with the public for that period of time. And these messages are incorporated into our live animal shows, to our dive shows, any opportunity that we can use to then reach a broader audience again with these key messages. And some of you may know this guy. So we also have our interactive video conferencing program. And this is a pilot we did. Um, we have not yet been able to put this out in a, a regular sustainable format. But we had Mike Russ from NOAA come out. And we have this really cool program called video conferencing. And what it is is a virtual um, classroom where our aquarium educators will go into our green room and they will provide a lesson to student, a group of students. So Mike Rust came in and he did one on aquaculture for both middle school and high school students. I would argue it was a great experience. Mike might tell you different. You can ask him about that later. <laughs> but um, yes, that was, that was just a great tool that we had. We're trying to figure out how to format it. It was one thing to have an outside scientist come in. We have to figure out how to do it within our own education department. And then we have our lectures and adult education series. So this, as you can see, reaches a much smaller audience, but it also allows us to talk a lot more about the context. This is more at a high school and maybe a junior college level. So we had our Future of Food series where we had food editor Russ Parsons come in. He hosted various opinion leaders and experts throughout the food supply. Um, but aquaculture was also featured in both. We had a two-part series. Um, there were organic meats. There was uh, organic produce. Um, but aquaculture was also featured. Some of you may know Paul Greenberg for Fish, American Catch. He was one of our guest speakers. Um, and he was very positive about aquaculture, although I don't know if you saw his latest Frontline series. It wasn't great. Uh, I don't know if you were recording that. <laughs> um, still like it, Paul. Uh, <laughs> Our Aquatic Academy um, on Marine Aquaculture. So Aquatic Academy is a four-part series. We do two a year. And so for four weeks, people can come in. It's an adult course. They come in uh, for two hours once a week, and we highlight a specific topic. So we did one on marine aquaculture. And um, the cool thing about that one was at the end of that course, we had asked the participants, what is it that you want to know about marine aquaculture? What have we not filled you in on? And what they told us was, you know, we can envision a dairy farm. We can envision a pig farm or a chicken farm. We have no idea what an aquaculture farm looks like. Um, and another thing that they had told us was when we had mentioned that we have marine farms off the coast of California, they were stunned. They had no idea. Um, so that spurred something else, which I will show you later. Um, but it was just, it was great to hear the feedback from the public. And, you know, it's one thing for us to kind of be in our bubbles and think about what we want the public to know, but it's another thing to understand what it is that they actually want to know. 
We also have our Coastal Conversations webcast, which my boss, uh, Jerry Schubel, sits down with some experts and they talk about a topic and marine aquaculture is featured. And then we have our lecture series about once a week for an hour and a half, we have a guest lecture. And we've had multiple on aquaculture, including a latest panel we had in partnership with the Institute of Environment and Stain Sustainability at UCLA um, a couple weeks ago. So this is the story map that came out of that discussion that we had from the Aquatic Academy that I was telling you about. So they said that they wanted spatial reference. They said they wanted images. They wanted to know more about aquaculture, both visually and both in getting some more information that they could wrap their heads around. So for my colleague, Jonathan Mackay, who some of you may know, he was actually a Sea Grant fellow, um, put this together for us. And you could see this isn't a very good picture, but you can see it kind of highlights where there are different farms on the coast. You can see the images, you click on the images, and this is what you would come up with. And so there's actually an image library in there. So if this were live, you could click those arrows and they could see more images of the actual farm to get a better idea. And then we just created some basic data to kind of give them an idea of what kind of species are being farmed, how are they being farmed, how much is being farmed in those locations. And then we have our short films. Uh, Gary brought this up. Uh, Perspectives on Marine Aquaculture. Hopefully some of you got to see this. this is our short 20 minute um, film featuring Mike and Paul and others. Um, it, it was a labor of love, two years in the making. <laughs> and then we have our fish story, uh, which is a short 10 minute video. And that I would argue was actually my boss's version of a mic drop at the World Aquaculture Society in 2016. I can't really explain it too much. You really got to watch it. Um, but it's he's he really highlights the importance of why we need to expand marine aquaculture and maybe is not shy about uh, bashing some of those who have not been forthcoming and helping us to expand it. Public outreach, um, we've also done a partnership with the Art Center College of Design. So they get a grant, I don't know if they get it yearly, but they have this ongoing grant where they get funded to work on ocean conservation issues. So they're really talented artists and they partner with the aquarium on a lot of topics. They partner with us on climate change, climate resilience, they've done some food, water, energy nexus uh, projects. But this year they did marine aquaculture. And so this was really exciting for us. These students are so talented. We took them on a short field trip to Hub Sea World Research Institute um, and to Carlsbad Aqua Farm. And it was amazing because I saw their notebooks at the end of the day. They do not take notes in writing like we do. They make these beautiful art pieces and that is their notes and they do this all so quickly. And this is a really powerful thing. The aquarium is really invested in art. And one of the reasons for this is, you know, we can be talking heads spewing facts all day long but the public really relates to art. We can really convey some really powerful, meaningful messages and have an impact if we start to rely more on and work more with the art community. So hopefully, and get some of these short videos working for you. Oops. Or maybe not. All right, well, it doesn't look like he wants to cooperate. Pardon? Oops. All right, well, that's a bummer. It is embedded. Do I have to connect to the internet? Oh, there's no purpose. internet connection, that's right. fine. Sorry guys, it's worth it, I promise. And they're really short. So the cool thing about these art projects that they did, um, and this is just a sampling of them, there were several projects that Mike Ruff helped advise on some of these. Um, we have an investor, one of our board members is going to invest and help us to fine tune these. So they are artists, they sometimes take their own liberties and away from the facts, so we have to reel them back in. So you're connected um, now. Oh great, thank you. Uh, but we do have an investor who is, oops, <coughs> who is going to um, invest and help us to exhibit these in the aquarium. All right, let's 
try this again. That's why it didn't work. When that came up earlier, when I loaded your talk, it was like cancel. <laughs> I didn't understand it. Exactly. Security enabled content. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I would argue, and, and maybe you have some other thoughts on this, I would argue it, it was very successful. And again, this was an opportunity where you know we did present, but the most important and, and key takeaway from that workshop was we had them write down their own questions and their comments on sticky notes and they passed them up to us. So we now have that on record and we know, now know from their perspective what it is that they and their audiences want to know. There were about 40 participants in that workshop, and so we're hoping to repeat that again um, in the next few weeks in Charleston, South Carolina, here stateside with the National Marine um, Educators Association. Again, just trying to build more cohesive messaging and get more institutions involved in telling the story about marine aquaculture or aquaculture in general. Some other opportunities we have to expand the reach. Uh, in April, I did a webinar with the Coastal Ecosystem Learning Centers, which some of you may be familiar with. Again, this is a NOAA program. There's, I believe, about 25 aquariums and science institutions involved in this. Um, so I provided a webinar on the importance of marine aquaculture to some of their education directors. Um, as I mentioned, the National Marine Educators Association later this month. Uh, we did have an abstract accepted for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, so we will be Again, reaching out to our colleagues and, and trying to figure out how we can work together on this messaging. And then the International Council for Exploration of the Sea and the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation. I put asterisks on those because we have not had our abstracts yet accepted, but um, those are other opportunities for us, again, to reach out to a broader audience and get more people on the same page. So again, making the connection is so important. And imagine if somebody hears that aquaculture is good for humans and the environment from their local waiter or chef. And then later on, they go to their retailer, and their fishmonger tells them the same thing. And then their kid comes home from school that day and says, hey, guess what I learned in school today? And they're hearing the same thing. And then that's reinforced from your local friendly aquarium in the Pacific. Um, that could be a very powerful thing. They say people th have to hear things at least three times for it to sink in. So we need to not just be saying these messages ourselves. We need to be spreading these messages across channels. So I'll leave with this quote. Alone we could do so little. Together we can do so much. We have to work together. We have to work with the industry. We have to work with our peers who are now at the C-Web Seafood Conference and figure out how to move forward with this messaging. Thank you. So uh, as a nonprofit on that side, we have to be very careful about that. We weren't trying to pr promote any one entity or so. Right now, it's just general information. Kim, when it comes to critical links on which audiences we need, do we have extension specialists should be working with? What, what are some of those groups <coughs> that you think are the key ones when it comes to the public? I would argue aquariums and science institutions. Um, as you saw, we alone, so we're the fourth largest aquarium in the U.S. We see 1.7 million a year. Um, so us and the national aquarium now is getting into the aquaculture message in, in a, a public-facing way. Uh, but a lot of institutions still only have that on the back end with their seafood advisory programs. They don't do much in the way of public education, but they're a powerful platform to do so if we can get it in those institutions. I don't know where to go next. <laughs>
Yeah, and so where the NGOs really have their power is through shaming and threats, right? So they'll target a company and say, if you bring in this product, we're going to put you on our social media hit list. And then they have their thousands of followers. And so, you know, for example, salmon, the reason a lot of those salmon companies got certifications wasn't because of public pressure, per se. It was because of the small few, that red, even though it's small, those guys have a very powerful voice and they have a lot of power. Um, so, so while it is, it is small, they still tend to have a lot of impact in terms of swaying perception. And this is what we're seeing in California. We're trying to get these farms in the water. Most people are indifferent, honestly, but there's that small group that, you know, they're trusted NGOs and they get people starting to think about these things. They keep calling, they keep comparing Rose Canyon to uh, industry feedlot for example, even though Rose Canyon is not even the water yet. I don't know how you could even make that comparison. Mm. So um, it's that's, that small group has a lot of power is the issue. All right, thank you very much. If you need to ask uh, Kim some additional questions, take it to break. Thank you.